Hi everyone, welcome to a new video series. I'm going to call this the Nerd Out series, which is uh, going to be pretty technical. It's a faceless series of videos where I'll um, be talking about all different kinds of subjects um, to do with the Snot Rocket, my Fiesta track car that's got a Honda K24 engine in it uh, that I turbocharged. Um, I'm running an ECU that a good friend of mine creates and en has engineered over the last 15 years uh, called the LPC-8 is the model um, and my friend is Balder and the uh, his business is called Balder's Control Systems so uh, check that out I've got a link in the description anyway so yeah um, this is the Nerd Out series. This is the first video in that series. Check the playlist on my YouTube channel. You can see probably more videos uh, as I add them to, to the playlist. This first video today is going to be about not control or detonation, as you may be familiar with the term. Um, so knock on a on an internal combustion engine uh, that runs on petrol or gasoline if you're american is uh, not desirable it's it requires a certain level of precise control um to not cause mechanical failure in the engine um so historically in the past um you would run an engine in a way that it doesn't knock at all um, whereas more modern engines with more advanced engine control units, like production cars and aftermarket standalone ECUs, um, you would be able to run the engine much closer to knock um, than you would historically, and the engine control unit will manage that and keep the engine as safe as it can. Um, and one of the reasons for that in a production car is so that you can have different types of fuel on the car and the engine is still safe so if the engine is rated at 300 horsepower from the factory on super unleaded as we call it in the uk so 97 98 ron um, if you did have to run it on 95 which i think is an eu requirement that all engines must be able to run on 95 then if the engine is tuned for 98 then it's going to require some kind of knock control strategy to run on 95 octane or 95 run, I should say. Um, anyway, so the, the point is knock control is super important. Um, in the old days, people didn't like to rely on it too much from an aftermarket ECU perspective because the knock control wasn't reliable um, and wasn't particularly advanced. And you often ended up with false detection of knock that, that impacted your engine performance unnecessarily so things have moved on a lot Bowder's ECU the LPC8 and LPC4 is a, a very good knock control capability and strategy or multiple strategies in the ECU um, which I'm going to do some talking through so as you can see um, my one of my cats Murdoch is not looking too impressed at me sitting there analyzing data but um, hopefully those watching won't have the same face uh, going on. So this, I'm going to go into briefly what knock is, um, what detonation is, um, why it's bad. Plenty of information available online if you have a quick Google. Um, so just to kind of give a disclaimer, I'm not a professional tuner. That is, it's not my day job. Um, I don't tune cars all day. Um, I've not been formally educated or certified in engine tuning so therefore i would never call myself a professional or even semi-professional um, so for the purpose of these videos and um, the explanations and the, the theories um, just treat it that i'm an enthusiast um, that is interested in building engines and tuning engines um, which i've done for you know a while now nearly two decades but um purely from an enthusiast perspective. So take the information in this video um, at that basis, treat, treat it as fun, accurate, potentially inaccurate, 
just my perspective um, and I don't have all the facts and all the science behind it. Detonation um, is where the fuel air mixture that's in the cylinder of the engine combusts at the wrong time. So as you're probably aware, you have a spark plug in a, in a petrol engine that fires at a particular point in the engine cycle, um, normally before the piston reaches top dead center or the top of the cylinder. Um, that sets a, a burn event on the, on the fuel air mixture that's in the cylinder. Um, and then as the cylinder moves back down the bore, um, that combustion event will reach um, peak pressure, which is effectively what gets translated into torque um, at some point as the, the piston starts to move down the cylinder. There is theory and data that shows the optimal um, crank angle um, of, of where you want to reach peak cylinder pressure. So what happens is after the spark plug has ignited the mixture, you've then got a period of time or what's called the flame front to propagate within the, the cylinder across the piston within the chamber to ignite as much of that air fuel mixture as possible. Um, there are situations where that air fuel mixture can spontaneously ignite separately from the spark event that's just happened. So imagine you've got the volume of mixture, the spark ignites it in one place, that then progressively burns um, across the mixture but it's possible for that mixture to um, ignite spontaneously elsewhere separate to the spark event that's propagating across um, the mixture and that is what's called detonation so there is another term called pre-ignition that's completely different um, and that's extremely destructive that's where the air fuel mixture ignites before the spark plug fires um, so when the, the piston is on its way back up the cylinder or near top dead centre, um, or no, it will be before it gets to TDC because you generally fire the plug before TDC up to 20, 30 degrees before. Um, so yeah, so pre-ignition is where the air fuel mixture pre-ignites before the spark plug fires and that leads to extremely high cylinder pressures when the piston and the crank is in the, the very wrong place for those pressures to exist. And that can cause uh, mechanical failure extremely quickly. Um, detonation, which is what we're talking about, or knock, um, is where you basically have an instable combustion event. Um, the spark plug's fired and then one or multiple ignition, um, not ignition events, because that's confusing with the spark plug, but multiple fire, uh, fires are occurring within that cloud of mixture within the cylinder uh, and it's out of control. And what that leads to is, um, again, sharp spikes in cylinder pressure um, and extreme temperature, which when harsh enough or prolonged enough, like multiple events happening over a period of a second or two, um, that can cause mechanical failure, it can cause pistons to fail, it can cause rods to bend, um, you know, ring glands will eventually crack off the top of the piston. Um, or, you know, you can, in some cases, punch a hole through the piston, although that's generally more to do with pre-ignition, that, that kind of radical failure mode. But um, So fundamentally, as you can tell, you don't want detonation. Um, detonation is caused by um, generally cylinder temperatures being too hot which causes that spontaneous combustion um, one of the things that um, spe specifically on a turbocharged engine running on pump fuel so you know petrol 95 98 ron not so much on um, fuels like e85 or race fuels which we don't obviously run on the street in the uk um, but if you have too much ignition advance, if you fire the um, the spark too early uh, in the cycle with a, a turbocharged engine where you've already got increased cylinder pressures caused by the forced induction uh, and the compressor on the turbo is pressurizing the air charge going in, um, then you can hit detonation just due to those excessive pressures and temperatures in the cylinder. 
Um, and the way that's that's measured, there's a there's a thing called MBT. There's, there's different definitions of what that is, but I was taught that it's mean best torque. Um, and basically what that means is an engine will produce its optimal amount of torque at one particular ignition angle or spark angle. Um, now on a naturally aspirated engine, you can generally wind in and advance the ignition as much as you want and you'll reach MBT. So you, you'll add ignition in 10 degrees, 15, 20, 30, whatever. You'll, you'll reach peak torque in the engine at that particular engine speed, full throttle or part throttle. And then if you add more ignition in, you, you don't gain any more torque and no more power. So ideally you want mean best torque spark angle, let's just say at 33 degrees, you end up with MBT, you'd, you'd basically lock the ignition in there. You wouldn't really want to go beyond that. Um, you may do in some such situations, but I'm not familiar with those. So the thing is with a turbocharged engine, you can very rarely hit MBT ignition um, on pump fuel, on super unleaded. What will happen is the engine will start to knock or detonate before you can wind in that much ignition. Um, so you may get to 12, 14, 18, maybe 20 degrees of ignition um, before you start to get detonation on a turbo engine, depending on how much boost you're running and the rest of the engine configuration and the fuel that you're running. Um, compared to a naturally aspirated engine where you could maybe run 30 degrees or 35 degrees and not have any detonation at all depending on the compression ratio. If it's a race engine that's naturally aspirated and you're running, I don't know, a static compression ratio of 12 to one or 13 to one or higher, then you probably won't be able to get MBT on pump fuel, which is when you then start to need using race fuel. So hopefully that gives a quick, probably a five minute explanation of detonation. It's excessive cylinder pressures that you want to avoid. Um, and on a turbocharged engine, you, you generally control that through the ignition angle, the spark advance that you're running at any one particular point. So just switching to my ECU calibration. Um, so this software here is, is Calibrator, BG Calibrator. This is the software that comes with um, the Bowders Control Systems ECUs. It's a very familiar interface you know for those that have used um, other ecus some of the more professional ones like life racing or back in the old days pectel or cosworth this may look somewhat familiar it's lightly modeled from a user interface perspective on some of those products because they just work and they're professional um, and they don't look a bit kind of fisher price like some of the, the new kids on the block um, so just from a, an ignition perspective so this here is this is a, the ignition table that I'm running on the snot rocket today. Um, on this column here, um, uh, on the y-axis, this is the boost pressure or manifold pressure map. Um, a thousand millibar, this is basically atmospheric pressure. Um, so no boost. And then for every row we go up, it's an extra 0.2 bar of boost. Uh, now the target boost I'm running on the snot rocket is 0.7 bar so at full throttle the ignition angle is somewhere between these two rows and the ecu interpolates between them so that basically means it it blends between those two values um, so for example here at 5000 rpm 0.8 bar of boost because this is absolute so basically take the one off the beginning 0.8 bar of boost it's 16 degrees of ignition 0.6 bar it's 19.5 and we're running 0.7 which is between those two so it'll probably end up running 17 and a half 18 degrees of ignition at 5000 rpm um, before any other modifiers might alter that ignition angle so that's the base spark angle as you can see as the engine speeds the engine speeds across the top as the engine speed increases so does the spark angle which is normal um, but then as we get above 6,000 RPM, start to reduce the ignition angle because the volumetric efficiency of the engine has dropped at that point. It's not blowing as much air um, as, it, as it would have been earlier on. We don't need to wind as much ignition in. And if you wind in a lot of ignition there, so the higher the number, the more ignition, the more advance you're running, um, the more chance there is of detonation.
this was we this spark table was created on the dyno um Alda flew over from iceland uh, joined me down at the uh, the hub dyno at talk developments uh, in essex uh, which is my local dyno um hired it for the day did a did three cars that day actually this was the first um we as a rule of thumb especially on a car like this which is it's not for drag racing where you're only giving it 10 seconds at a time you know this is um 20 minutes on track sessions where heat will build up into the engine and i've got later in this video i will start to show you how heat makes a difference to ignition and knock um so what the way you do it is you basically map a bit of headroom into the base spark table so on the dyno which was towards the end of february it was cold the dyno cell was cold there was a lot of airflow um, we were only doing one kind of power sweep at a time it wasn't two minutes or three minutes of on and off running it was kind of one power sweep and then tweak and then go again so the engine didn't get particularly hot um, this was mapped with three degrees of headroom so what we did is we advanced the spark angle beyond these values here um, so to give you an idea the turbo spools up at around 3500 which is why these values up here never get touched basically everything in this part of the table or at least this part of the table will never get accessed because the turbo can't produce those boost pressures at those engine speeds um, the turbo will start to spin up at around 3000 so this is probably the kind of path that it will take uh, and then up here so um, we advanced the ignition on the dyno until we reached detonation and we were calibrating the knock control system um, so we listen to knock through a stethoscope or deck hands as they're known no electronics just literally um, a pair of ear defenders with a pipe that goes to the engine block cylinder head which is basically a stethoscope you, you audibly hear the detonation through the headphones you don't need any electronics or any amplifiers or headphones or anything you're literally using a stethoscope which is an old school method but it's extremely effective uh, on most engines um, so we advanced the ignition to until it detonated across across the board and then we backed it off by three degrees so that basically means you should never hit detonation under those conditions again um, you've got three degrees of headroom that means if you've got um you know a slightly warmer day or the fuel's gone off a bit or you've had to go from say 99 ron to 97 or you've gone to supermarket fuel that um you're not going to you're not going to hit knock i mean the knock control system will deal with it anyway which we'll get onto later but for the for the most the majority of driving of the car um the knock control system shouldn't be getting hit at all it shouldn't really have to do anything because you've you've set your base spark table away from the knock limit um that's particularly useful on an engine like this which is you know it's an off the shelf second hand high compression naturally aspirated engine with a turbo bolt to it which is fundamentally wrong in how you should turbocharge an engine so because of that you want to you want to try and tune it as safely as you can now you that in, you can't just keep retarding the ignition though you get so if you look at the top line here where it's got seven degrees that's a safety value so we, we never that's in case there's a boost control problem or a pipe comes off the wastegate or the wastegate fails and it runs more boost than expected the engine will basically retard the ignition significantly to drop the power and to pretty much eliminate the chance of detonation happening um, but the downside of that and again this is under an unusual condition not normal um, the more you retard the ignition the later the combustion event the hotter the exhaust gas is and um, so your what's known as egt your exhaust gas temperature will go through the roof um, to a level that you know could damage the turbo or a catalytic converter if you've got one um, so this is purely a, a temporary safety thing to stop the engine um, exploding in the event of um, a boost spike that's that's not expected um, so the point is you you can the more you retard the ignition the hotter the exhaust temperature um, sort of 12 degrees is a is a good value to aim for so you know when you look up here we're getting close to that 
um, maybe 14 degrees. So there's not a huge amount of headroom. With this engine package, this turbo, these cams, um, the, the VVT angle that we're, we're running, there isn't a lot of headroom to add more boost in. Um, you're going to quickly get, you're going as, as you increase the boost, as you can see, you, know, you pick any particular engine speed, 5,000 again, at atmospheric it's 26 degrees, and that ignition angle gradually gets retarded the more boost you run. Um, and that's because the more boost you run, the higher the cylinder pressures, the more chance there is of detonation. You have to change when the ignition event happens to basically control cylinder pressures and temperatures. Um, so the more boost you run, the less ignition you generally run. Um, we're very quickly going to get, especially at like 7,000, where we're at 13 degrees at 0.8 bar. You know, if we were running one bar up here, I'd have to scale the table differently. But, you know, we might be down to 12 degrees or 11. Um, and that's not ideal. You know, you wouldn't want to be holding it at 10 or 11 degrees for too long, um, especially if you haven't monitored the exhaust gas temperature going into the turbocharger. So you have to measure it going into the turbine. I think, you know, most turbochargers um, are rated to maybe 850, 900 degrees Celsius going into the turbine, there are higher temperature versions that can go up to say 1100 degrees, 1200, which are more suited for like anti-lag purposes or very modern engines. Um, but you know, a traditional turbo from the last 20, 30 years, between eight and 900 degrees going in is a good value. And as soon as you start to go below sort of 12, definitely 10 degrees of ignition, um, you're going to start to exceed those exhaust temperatures and potentially damage the turbo. Um, so you can you can see when you look at the spark table, you can start to see, you know, how this engine is happy, what adding more boost will do to the ignition angle, um, and how ultimately you're going to run into a, a limit on how much you can retard it based on the other components um, in the car. So that's that's an explanation of spark table at very basic level um, all of these values here are basically crews you tend to run a lot of advance on crews um, this looks very um, coarse the control the the 10 degree area this is around idle um, this ecu has got a very good adaptive idle control strategy that varies the um, the ignition angle to control idle speed and and also the throttle position electronic throttle um, so this is just set to 10 because there's another strategy that basically uses that as a base and then adapts it to um, to maintain the idle speed that you want um, and then these values don't really get hit or used for very long because when you're cruising you're generally in this kind of area here um, and the ECU interpose so you don't need to have super detailed super smooth table I mean some people look at these things and they want it to look like a work of art with perfect kind of rainbow color. Um, but it's really not necessary for a lot of tables. And mission is definitely. So the purpose of this video is to look at how this ignition table has performed under different operating conditions. Um, so luckily this ECU has got an excellent logging capability and a, and a fantastic log viewer software built into it. So what I'll do is I'll switch over to um, the log from the dyno. So this is, this is the data viewer, this is Bowder's data viewer. Um, and you can fully customise the charts that you see, the data that you see. On the right hand side here there's a whole bunch of sensors and values that are logged and um, this isn't all of them but there's an enormous amount in here i haven't bothered customizing it which you can um, but i haven't yet but um, for the purpose of this we'll be looking at the spark angle for cylinder one which is here um keep an eye on that i'll put that up if I spark angle one there we go that's at the top Spark angle one is cylinder one ignition angle. As I, as I said, you tend to fire before TDC and this point is 18. So on, on this diagram, the white line down the middle is the current marker that you're viewing. So the data in the right hand column here is relative to where the white line is. 
Um, and then I've got one, two, three, four. I've got five different charts with different pieces of data um, being displayed in each one. Uh, and in each each chart, you can see the description. So green here is engine speed. At this white marker, it's currently at 2,849 RPM. And then in the brackets, it shows the range across the whole data log. So this is the whole log here. Um, and I'm just zooming in. So um, what, and then the red line here is map. So that's manifold pressure. Um, to give you an idea of what's going on here, um, you need to look at the chart below. So this chart here shows you what gear you're in. So this was on the dyno. We did all of the runs in third gear. Um, the green line on this second chart is the accelerator pedal position, APP. Um, and the yellow line is the throttle position. So that's the actual throttle body itself where the butterfly is. And 90% is basically 90 degrees and that's fully open. Um, now, when you do drive by wire, the accelerator pedal and the throttle butterfly position are not one to one. You have a table where you map that to give you the drivability that you want. Um, so if you look here, basically the engine's idling. Um, along the bottom of each chart, you've got a timer. So this is the timeline. The engine was running for a minute, um, just idling before this test. And then we got here at one minute and nine seconds. And then you can see the throttle um, started to open um, just to bring the speed up. So on the dyno, you, you put it in gear. You then have to increase the engine speed a bit and then bring the clutch up. Um, I think, as it was saying, it was in third gear already. That was already done. Um, but the way the dyno works is you set a speed to start the sweep at. So a sweep is where the dyno will control the engine speed from one speed to another. So we set it, I think, from 2,000 to 7,500. Um, what you do is you go full throttle. Uh, and if you look up here, the dyno is holding the speed. Now on this green line here, if you look at the top left-hand column here, you can see the speed 2213 holds that for a couple of seconds. Um, and that's the dyno holding that. Now, whilst the dyno is holding that and you're at full throttle, because you can see here, your the green line, the, the accelerator pedal is flat out now, but the engine speed staying the same. And that's how a, dyno, that's how a, a steady state dyno works. But the red line is the manifold pressure. And even at 2000 RPM, you can see it's already starting to make a bit of boost. So it starts off here. You look at the red line and the value up here, it's at 1059 millibar, which is basically no boost. But as by the time the actual test starts here, um, it's at 0.2 bar. So the turbo has been able to get some heat and energy into it to, um, start to produce some boost before the test even started anyway so then here at this point here you can see the engine speed starts to ramp up in a controlled manner i think it was set to 15 seconds the sweep so it will go from 2000 rpm to 7500 rpm over a 15 second period and the dyno controls that um, so what you can see is as the engine speed starts to increase the turbo starts to do its job and the red line is the boost pressure um, and it ends up hitting 1.7 um, or 7.7 bar because uh, this is absolute so you take one atmosphere off 700 millibar which is 0.7 bar of boost about 10 pounds of boost um, by what speed is this 3600 rpm actually it's 3500 it reaches its target boost it's not bad for a big T4 turbo, um, you know, with an engine that's generally designed for quite high revving. Um, it doesn't have cams in it for t tons of low end torque, um, but it is a 2.4 liter, which, which, um, and as you can see, as the run goes on, it reaches the limit up here. The boost pressure is consistent. And then once it hits the, the limiter, uh, or the, the dyno holds it for a couple of seconds, we then back off on the throttle. Um, so that's, this is, that's, that's the general operation of the dyno, just to give you some background. So you go full throttle, 
holds the engine at, at start speed. You then press go. It then gives you a controlled sweep, still at full throttle, reaches the target speed, and then you back off later. And the dyno will show you the the torque curve and the you know the, the graphs that you like to see um, when running an engine on a dyno. Now, with that in mind, now that we've kind of learned that together, um, as this is about knock control. So the knock sensor is basically a microphone that you bolt to the engine and knock or detonation sounds like, it's like a ticking noise. Imagine dropping a metal ball bearing in a bean tin. It's that kind of a noise. It's like a tick noise. Um, and it happens when you, when you don't want it to, as we've discussed. So this green line down here, um, this is the output of the knock sensor itself. So like I said, it's a microphone. It's picking up all of the noise of the engine. Um, and this is what it displays it as. Here. Now, what's crucial, um, and, and just to give you some more context, this red line here is the knock threshold. So if this green line crosses the red line, the ECU thinks that knock, knock or detonation has happened, and then it takes... Um, remedial action. Um, this graph is not particularly useful. The reason why is because, you know, when you're operating an engine at several thousand RPM, the amount of combustion events per second is is very high. Um, we can calculate that. It's fundamentally the the rate of combustion events is much greater than the rate that we're sampling the data in the data logging. Now, as we zoom in. You can see, you know, if we go down to like tenths of this is one second between here and here. So this is this here is one second. And as you can see, the amount of samples, it only took 32 samples across one second. Now to give you an idea of the number of events, so let's say what speed was that? 3500 RPM. If we do 3500 RPM divided by 60. Um, there's 58 um, combustion events um, per second at that speed and at 7000 RPM it's over 100 um, so if we're only sampling 32 records then the chances are we could miss um, in this log we could miss in the log the detonation happening. And the way the detonation is represented is this green line would have a big spike in it that would cross the red line. Um, but unless you're logging at a high enough frequency, which this ECU can do, it's just it's not particularly important to do so unless you're doing very specific testing, um, you're not going to see it. Now, that is purely from a logging perspective. So... That means the data log won't may not show the actual debt event happening. However, the ECU will know about it. So the ECU operates fast enough to detect knock at any engine speed that it supports. This is purely about data logging, which is really just for me as a, a human being to assess and analyze. So there are other ways of detecting if knock has happened. Um, and this this particular chart here, there's some values here: knock sum, knocked cylinder, knock severity. These are the actual um, values or counters that you would use to determine if knock has happened, not the output of the knock sensor itself here below. So, um, generally, what happens with with detonation is if the ECU detects knock, what it does, going back to the spark table is it will effectively retard this. So let's just say it's configured to take three degrees out if it detects knock. This value here that's um, 19.5 would become 16.5. Um, and that would be for a short period of time. Um, and then it will gradually go back to normal in case it was a one off. Um, so there's an adaptive table in the ECU that learns. Um, through the knock control how much ignition to take out at different speeds at different boost levels uh, and it continuously maintains and updates that to give you peak performance um so like one knock event happening won't permanently reduce the power 
that particular engine speed or boost pressure it will do it for an amount of time and then decay that um, until it happens again um, now that is this bottom chart here shows that so this is the knock retard value for each cylinder one two three four because obviously it's a four cylinder engine and what this does is it shows you how much ignition it's taken out at any particular point now if you look these are all zero each one is zero 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 that means for this particular data log it's not had to retard the ignition because of knock at all um, now just to give you a bit more context so this is obviously just one run it took 15 seconds um, I put this pink trace in here just to show it in coolant temperature um, and as you can see it, it's running at low 80s when it's at idle um, in the dyno and then the end of the power run um, as you can see you get to the power run the, the, the pedal shuts and the coolant temperature continues to rise until um, the fans in the dyno cell have been able to do their job to, to cool the engine down and the fan on the, the engine itself on the radiator so you can see that you know just that one 15 seconds has caused the coolant temperature to go up then it's taken a few seconds to recover um, afterwards um, yeah so this is you know this is an example of a quick test on a dyno it's a quick sweep it doesn't get a huge amount of heat into the engine um, you know it's not representative of you know beast in a car around a track for 20 minutes half an hour you know multiple laps of the Nürburgring or anything like that this is a quick run on the dyno which is why you can't just trust and rely on what you see on a dyno being safe on the road for the engine and I'll, I'll hopefully be able to demonstrate that as we go through uh, this video. So moving on, off the back of the dyno, which was in February, it was cold. Um, got some other data here. So here's a, here's, this is the same run on the dyno. You can see here the, the air temperatures were 19 degrees going into the engine the green trace here nine degrees no, 19 degrees sorry and then once the, the there was actually some airflow through the intercooler at full throttle that inlet air temperature drops to 13 degrees so when it's just idling and the dyno fans are turned down because you know, they're noisy and you tend to turn them down when you're not doing a power run um, you can see that you know the, there's a bit there's a certain element of heat soak into the intercooler which increases the air temperature but then as soon as you go full throttle um, and, in and in conjunction with um, the dyno fans being turned on which you know is, is similar to driving the car faster on the road you can see the temperatures drop so that's a good example of heat soak but also how quickly the temperatures drop once you've got airflow going through the intercooler both the air going through it into the engine but also the air passing through it to cool that charge air you know it kind of makes me chuckle a bit when people on the internet and on forums and groups and whatever they worry so much about heat soak but when you're passing hundreds of litres of air through the intercooler or a pipe or something it, the temperature just goes back to normal within seconds like you know it, it, how long was this this was from going full throttle to reaching its lowest temperature took eight seconds um, you know and that dropped it went from 17 degrees to 13 degrees in nine seconds so that didn't take very long and to be honest the intercooler is one of these big heavy uh, air tech units which you know is not potentially the quickest responding heat exchanger so you know th this gives you some real data um, of how quickly heat soak goes away more important when you're drag racing and you want to be able to punch it off the line and get instant performance but as soon as you're actually moving on the road you've got some airflow it's really not a problem general tuning and and man engineering waffle than it is about not but hopefully you'll find it 
somewhat interesting uh, that's the point of these videos is is it interesting is it annoying is it accurate or inaccurate i mean that's really down to you to determine um but this is my perspective as i go through so anyway that's the temperatures um it was a cold day um we had um no issues well we, we detected where debt was we tuned the engine away from debt not control on the subsequent days where we then took it off the dyno and then mapped it on the road um, again there was no signs of detonation um, and let me just do that just to just to show you that that didn't happen so we mapped it on the 25th and then the day after was tuning on the road let's have a look at a road log so this is this is tuning on the road and if i look at the not control um values um this is a, a this is a 15 minute log i'm just looking to see if we had any full throttle we did have some throttle so let me see where's full throttle over here somewhere so this was a, this was a full throttle pull um between here and here see that's full throttle um and what you'll see here particularly is on the knocked sum so that's the total incremental number of knock events or detected knock within the log there's zero so again it was a cold day this run went from 4700 rpm to 7000 full throttle it had all the boost that it's supposed to have and the knock sensor output i know i said don't rely on that but it's pretty flat um there was no knock events at all um knock severity zero knock sum zero everything zero so this is on the road now testing it no no knock events at all the knock retard is just flat it's not having to take any ignition out so that was the day after the dyno end of february cold day let's have a look at what we're outside um so yeah the air temperature going into the engine across this whole graph was between 10.2 degrees and 14 points so that's 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 not the ambient temperature outside that's actually what's going into the engine after the intercooler um, so a very cold day um, super efficient super fast if anybody you know you, if you've owned a turbocharged car you know that on a cold day it just feels so much quicker uh, and this is the reason why you know on a cold day the air is denser you can run more ignition it's fast you're making more power um, i think i think manufacturers when they quote the power of a car so let's say i don't know a golf r or something is 300 horsepower on, on in the book um i think that's rated at 40 degrees in that temperature so bear in mind this was only at 10 degrees or 11 um the the manufacturers i think there's a standard that they they use to quote the power so 40 degrees if it's below 40 degrees you're potentially making more power than what's in the book or whether it's 30 degrees or 40 whatever if it's a really cold day you're potentially making more power um which is why you know in the summer turbocharged cars feel a bit more sluggish and in the winter they super quick you can get any traction it's noticed to be different So this was the day after the dyno. As I've shown, there's no knock, so there's nothing more to show on this log. Now, stepping forwards a little bit, um, I'm going to go to this log here. So this was this one. So this here was a 25-minute journey, um, and this was on the 22nd of July. Um, which was quite a hot day i think it was over 25 degrees outside um you know when you look at this chart here if i go back to the temperatures which is where we are now the inlet temperature rather than being like 10 degrees to 14 it varied between 23 30 nearly 32 degrees so that shows you the increase in ambient temperature and how it's affecting the way the intercooler works um ignore the compressor inlet temperature number the red one so ignore that for now 
Um, but you can see it's a much warmer day. I don't have the ambient temperature, but it was definitely in the high 20s. Um, and the purpose of mentioning that is, you know, as I said before, the ignition was three degrees away from debt back in basically the winter. This will now show you what happens in the summer. So um, to give you a bit more context, this graph here shows the engine coolant temperature and the oil temperature. Now I don't have oil temperature data for um, the dyno because I've only recently installed the sensor. But if you remember, the coolant temperature was at like low 80s in the dyno cell. Whereas here, if I take a, um, an event where the car was driven under load at kind of full throttle, so here's a few kind of squirts on a private road. Um, if I pick here, you can see that at this point, the coolant temperature is at 97 um, and the oil temperature is at 108. So that's considerably warmer than when it was in the dyno. Um, and as you see, the coolant temperature is struggling. The oil temperature is continuously going up. Um, it only plateaus when you're cruising. So um, this is this is kind of cruising. You can see here the road speed is pretty flat. Um, the throttle pedal is pretty flat at around 50%. Um, so this is cruising along at 60, 70 miles an hour. Um, and the oil temperature does level off, but it's still 103 degrees, which is okay. Um, but as soon as you put, you know, put your foot down, the oil temperature starts to creep up and the water temperature starts to get out of control. It doesn't have enough capacity to, to, to shed that heat. Uh, and this was just like second, third, fourth gear, fifth gear kind of all <coughs> just a one off on a hot day already getting out i'll do a deeper analysis on that but the point is it's a hot day it doesn't take a lot for the engine temperature to kind of get out of control um on this particular run which bearing in mind this was just a cruise home um from somewhere 20 minute drive a warm day with just a you know a handful of full throttle um, events and the, the water temperature and the oil temperature were getting too high you know it certainly wouldn't withstand a minute or five minutes or you know 10 minutes going around the Nürburgring um, with this current uh, cooling problem now going back to knock which is the purpose of this video you know if we then bear in mind that it was a hot day or the temperatures were a lot hotter um, how did that affect us from a knock perspective now this is already starting to look quite different so this bottom chart here knock retard you can see there are blips in here now. um it's th this this is the gold right so this is now saying well something's different right the engine wasn't knocking at all before um now it is knocking um and by knocking you know now i explain what knock was but it, we don't we're not talking like a knock like going um you know like bottom end knock or you know knock you can audibly hear when you're standing there looking at the engine this is detonation knock it's a confusing term but it's it's a different thing so let, let's let's dig into this a little bit more so the two obviously at the bottom here you've, you've still got the green line which is the output of the knock sensor again don't pay too much attention to that. um although you know interestingly we take the first knock event so <coughs> when we look here it says knock sum three zero to three so it was up to three it counted so in this window of 25 minutes where there was only a, a handful of full throttle um events um you can see that it knocked it detected knock three times not the end of the world it's not tragic but it did something about it, it the, the strategy in the ecu the way we've mapped it, it did something about it so i'm going to drill into it a bit so the green line on this chart shows the knock sum so as soon as that green line goes up here that's where the knock happened. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? When you look down at the knock level, the green, this is the output of the knock sensor. There's nothing here. There are no spikes that show the knock event. This is what I'm saying. The data login isn't fast enough, or I haven't configured it. 
be fast enough to show it in this chart. It really doesn't matter because the, the faster you log, the more storage you take up on the SD card in the ECU. And you don't need it because the ECU will log when knock happened. You don't need to see it on the output of the knock sensor. All you need to know is when the ECU detects. So looking here, I'm going to zoom in. What you'll see is the green line here. Um, that will go from zero to one here. See, I've just gone across. Uh, it's now at one. So that meant it detected um, one, um, one knock event. And the red line is which cylinder did it detect knock on. So this ECU does per cylinder knock detection. So it knows accurately which cylinder um, had detonation. So in this case, it was cylinder three. Um, and knock severity is is a is a global value. It's basically when you look at the output of the knock sensor and what the knock threshold is that we've configured. It's how far over that threshold was the knock event. So you know one um, one degree is not massive, but there was light knock that just triggered the threshold. Um, <coughs> but the ECU reacted quickly to it. So if we and this was if we look at the speed, I mean this this knock happened at we go back up to the top chart where it shows engine speed, it was at seven thousand RPM. So a lot can go wrong very quickly at that kind of a speed. Um, you know, you don't want um to be having um you know significant knock happening um at that kind of a speed because things just happen so quickly, there's a lot of heat in the engine spinning very fast you know you can lose an engine very quick if you've got really severe knock but this was quite light it was just one ping um, but the ecu quickly tracked it um, and the way to see that is you look down here at the knock retard value as we saw it was cylinder three that knocked and when you look down at knock retard three pulled one degree of ignition instantly um, you can see here it pulled it and what you'll see that's interesting is over time, not, not very long, maybe half a second, three quarters of a second, the amount of ignition that it retarded slowly decayed. It dropped back to normal. And that's the way the strategy works. It, it pulls it and then it retards. Um, and as the knock happens, so basically what it does is, it, you know I was talking about mean best torque. Um, it basically tries to keep the ignition at the optimal angle um, based on the fuel and whatever. And, and if it's doing a lot of knocking, um, it builds up an adaptive table that basically maintains that for a period of time and then gradually decays all of it. So it's constantly learning and evolving um, based on the conditions that you're running, the fuel that you're running, um, and to give you the peak performance and to you know give the engine some safety. Um, so it doesn't just pull it and keep it. I mean, this is all configurable, right? This is just how we've configured it, that you know it's it's adaptive spark. Um, it's rapid, it protects the engine, but it also tries to maintain peak performance as well. Um, all of that is configurable. The decay time is, the amount of ignition it can pull out during a knock event is configurable. Um, I can go through that in detail on how it's calibrated in a separate video. Um, so what you'll see is um, knock retard um, 3, which is the yellow one, confusingly, that was the biggest retardation. So it retarded just cylinder three, which is the one that knocked. But the way we've configured it, we've got it in a blended mode. And there's, there's three different modes that the knock control can retard. You can have it so it only retards the cylinder that knocked. Um, you can have it so that it retards all cylinders equally. And when it detects knock on any cylinder, which is the safest option. Or you can have a blended approach where it will retard mostly the cylinder that knocked so here you can see cylinder three retarded one degree um, but then all of the other cylinders retarded as well they retarded 0.4 so this is this is the blended approach it, it focuses on the cylinder that knocked and takes the most ignition out but it also takes a, a little bit out of the cylinders around it um, so that um, you know in case there is like a radical change in fuel or something's gone wrong, it does also preemptively protect the other cylinders as well.
Um, so that, that's, that's quite smart, and again, it is fully configurable. So this was the first knock event. Cinder 3 knocked, it pulled a degree out, that decayed back down. Um, so there were three knock events. If we go across and look for the next one, so we look here at knock sum, that's currently one. It's the green line. If I go across the log, zoom out a bit, it happens way off. You can see here it is. So this is where the next knock event happened. The green line's jumped up. That's gone from knock sum one to knock sum two. And if you look again, it's cylinder three that's knocked. So before the event, that goes back to zero, knocked cylinder. Um, when the knock event happens, it just logs it for a couple of seconds. So you can see in the log which cylinder it was that knocked. Um, again, it was number three. The cylinder three is knocked twice, and you know <clears throat> there may be a pattern occurring here, and you have to think, well, why, why is one cylinder knocking more than the others? And generally speaking, it's down to flow or heat around the cylinder. So if you've got an inlet manifold or an exhaust manifold where one cylinder flows more than another or one doesn't flow as much as the other um, when you are um, you know when you're mapping the fueling of an engine and you've only got one lambda sensor one oxygen sensor in like the downpipe um, and you've mapped it for the target air to fuel ratio that you want say 12 to 1 or whatever um, if there's unequal flow across the individual cylinders that's a combined air to fuel ratio so if you've got two cylinders that are flowing 10% more than another two, then your 12 to 1 air to fuel ratio is not 12 to 1 in every cylinder. Some cylinders will be below 12 to 1, so richer. Two cylinders would be above 12 to 1 and leaner. What that means is the two cylinders that are flowing more, um, which are now running a leaner mixture, they will run hotter. As we know, heat is a contributing factor to detonation. So why is cylinder three knocking? We've had two knock events out of three. Let's just quickly see what the th which one the third event was. Let's just scroll across. Here's the third event. Let's see what cylinder that was. Well, in that case, it was cylinder one. It was a different cylinder. But there's been three knock events. Two of them were in cylinder three. One was in cylinder one. Um, we'll assess that one separately. But going back to the point, um, <clears throat> You know, if cylinder three in this engine is flowing more air than the other two, other three cylinders, then that could be why it's it's starting to knock. And another reason why um, it could knock is the temperature. So, looking back a few minutes ago, we saw that you know this engine on this day in July was running a lot hotter than it was back on the dyno. Now, if you think of I'm not an expert, I don't have deep knowledge on the Honda K engine on, on how the cooling works around the, the cylinder, the block. But, you know, if you think the cylinders that are, this is a theory, the cylinders that are kind of in the middle of the engine are likely to have less effective cooling than the outer cylinder. So if you think, well, cylinders two and three, it's an inline four, cylinders two and three are together in the middle of the engine. That's potentially, and this is a theory, they are potentially running warmer than cylinders one and four, which are on the outer side of the engine. So there's more um, radiated heat um, being available around cylinders one and four because they're on the ends of the engine than two and three that are central. Um, and an example of this, another example is a Subaru flat four engine, a Boxer. The, the t obviously that's a flat engine, but the, the cylinders at the rear of the engine don't get cooled as well as the ones at the front because, you know, when the car's driving along, um, all the airflow through the radiator and through the front of the car is hitting cylinders one and four on the front of the engine, or one and three, whatever it is, on the front of the engine, um, but the rear cylinders don't get the same cooling effect just from a radiated heat. Um, and therefore, when you look at... Um, the mapping the factory mapping for a subaru engine it has per cylinder trim for both fuel and, and ignition and the rear bank the rear cylinders run slightly less ignition advanced than the front ones and that's because they're more prone to knock um, so 
this ECU Bowder's LPC8 does also have per cylinder trim for fuel and ignition. At the moment, I'm not using them. So it's just the same ignition angle for every cylinder until they're not controlled into V. The base ignition is fixed equally across the cylinders. It doesn't have any compensation. Now, what I may look to do, if I determine that um, this engine is more prone to knock on cylinders two and three, for whatever reason, whether it's you know temperature of the engine or whether it's flow of the engine, then I could either add more fuel to cylinders two and three compared to one and four, or retard the ignition a bit. I'd rather add fuel because when you add fuel, you effectively cool the combustion um, event down, which again, heat is the thing that causes detonation. If you can cool the cylinder by adding some more fuel, um, then that can kind of thwart knock. Uh, and that's probably something that I will look at doing. Um, I'm unable at the moment to determine if it's an unequal flow problem or a temperature problem because the exhaust manifold doesn't allow me because it's a cast iron log manifold it doesn't allow me to run a thermocouple in each exhaust runner to see what the individual cylinder exhaust temperatures are because as i said if you if you have two cylinders that flow more air than the other two they will run hotter because the fueling is is, a, is the sum across all cylinders so if you run a, a thermocouple, a temperature sensor in each exhaust runner, you can very quickly see if one or more cylinders um, is running noticeably hotter than the others. And then you know pretty much that you've either got a flow um, inconsistency across the cylinders, which is normally a function of inlet manifold design or exhaust manifold design. Or it could be something like a fuel injector working properly. It's sticky. It's not delivering the right amount of fuel. but on the assumption that the injectors are all fine and they've been tested, if you're seeing high exhaust temperatures in one or more cylinders, that will generally mean they're flowing more air. And in that case, you can compensate within the ECU. You don't strictly need to change the manifolds and change the design of them unless they're way out. If it's just one or two percent adjustments that you need to make from a fuel, preferably, but maybe ignition perspective, you can do that in an ECU line. <coughs> so this was a quick drive, 25 minutes in July. Um, it was a 25 minute drive, mostly cruising. So just going back to the main data here. You can see here at the bottom, this is road speed. Um, you can see this part of the map, the first six minutes was just kind of poodling around a slower area. Um, and then this part here was cruising at uh, an average um, of 97 kilometers an hour, so about 60 miles an hour. Um, and then it tapers down to kind of more urban speeds again. So the point is, it was mostly cruising. Uh, you look at the top chart, this shows what gear the car was in. It was mostly in sixth gear for that period, um, just cruising along at. Uh, an average of 60 miles so not not a particularly challenging drive it was a hot day but it was not a particularly hard drive there were a few full throttle squirts and you saw the effects of that with knock now to put that into perspective if the engine was mapped with three degrees of headroom on spark back in the colder temperatures on the dyno the fact that on a hot day with minimal load you know not repeated load just a couple of bits of full throttle is having to pull ignition out. That basically means you've used up all of that three degrees of headroom and you're having to retard beyond that headroom to make the engine safe. So if it pulled one degree out and that was the right amount at 7,000 RPM or whatever, that means that you, you've now lost four degrees from where it was um, originally back in February. So that, that shows you how important Hot temperatures are whether it's the ambient air temperature going through the turbo and into the engine or whether it's cooling system whatever those things are that extra heat makes the engine much more prone to detonation 
I'm going to show you another graph. So this was taken um, on August the 22nd, I think. Um, now this was a track day. So this was the first shakedown um, of this, this car, this engine package um, on a track with repeated load. Now, what you will see looking here, this is not a big log. Like this starts at zero minutes and, and ends at five minutes, right? And as you can see, just looking at the engine speed and the map, once you get to sort of three minutes in, it all drops off. So this is the cool down lap. So there's basically three minutes, three laps of Brands Hatch Indy, roughly a minute per lap. Um, and then there's a cool down lap. So it's four laps, three hot laps, reason like probably like eight tenths, and then a cool down lap. And the reason for that is obvious in this, this pink line here. This is the coolant temperature. Across those three minutes, it went from 81 degrees to 106 nearly, which is too hot. You know, you don't want your coolant at that level. You may be like 110, 115, you start to risk losing head gaskets. So I, I was monitoring the coolant temperature in the car on track. There's a video of the track times and track action elsewhere in the channel. So go and check that out. Um, but basically once the temperature got to 105, I lifted um, and went back. I did a cool down lap and went back into the pits. Um, and that's just part of an ongoing cooling related issue that I need to solve with, with the radiator improvements. But the important thing here from a not perspective is this bottom chart. You can see this is noisy now. So you remember back on the dyno chart, these, these bottom not retard values were zero. There was no knock at all. Um, but here on track, uh, and you'll see that once it's on the cool down lap, there's no knock. There's a blip here, but that could be a false positive. But when it's under load on track, and bear in mind, this is literally drive out the pits, do three laps of brands. Um, this was a hot day. It was 22nd of August, uh, 2023. Um, it was probably 26, 27 degrees Celsius. So not, not ridiculously hot, what it shows, the temperatures. So, yeah, I mean, this was hotter than the July. I mean, you look here at the air temperatures. Bear in mind, there's a bit of heat soak because it was repeated use on track. But this was showing charge air temperatures between 26 and 36 degrees. Um, and that was gradually increasing. If you look at the trend, as the intercooler starts to uh, heat soak um, from prolonged exposure to those hotter temperatures, you'll see that there's a trend here going up. I mean, it probably would have leveled off at 50 degrees, um, but I couldn't get that far in testing because the coolant temperature was out of control. Um, but yeah, you can see the inner temperatures were a lot warmer. So going back to the knock, you can see here, this is just much noisier now. Um, it detected, let me clarify. So this bottom table doesn't show you when knock happened. This bottom chart here, table, this chart shows you when it's retarding ignition. So you know I said it's adaptive and it learns. Well, these values at the bottom are basically what that adaptive table is telling the ECU to do. So this is the learned ignition retard value. It's not when knock events happen. And the, the reason I point that out is because when you look up here, knock sum, so the total number of knock events across this five minute data log was seven. It wasn't, it doesn't match with these ones on the bottom. That was just where, because you're doing repeated use on track and repeated full throttle pulls, it's going to repeat the amount of knock retard it applies to keep the engine safe from what it's learned. Um, so yeah, so the bottom, just to clarify then, so the bottom chart is not the number of knock events, it's just when it applies um, retarded ignition to, to protect the engine where it has knocked previously. Um, and because when you go around track it's and it repeatedly knocks like seven times in this instance, it basically keeps um, triggering that adaptive knock to keep that retard in place. Um, you know, as soon as you you kind of lift and no, don't have any more knock events, then that adaptive um, knock table will start to decay and go back to zero, and it won't retard it until you go back out again. 
So just to dig into this a little bit, um, I appreciate this is really nerdy, hence the name of the series. It's the Nerd Out series. I'm sure some people will like this. Some people would have switched off already. Um, but um, what you'll see here, the and this, this log may not be the first lapse that I went out, so it may already have had some um, knock history in the adaptive table. So let's look for the first knock event. So we're looking here, we're looking for the green trace. The first knock event was here, and it was multiple events. So you see this green line, it went one, two, three, four. So you'll probably find that by the time we get here, there's four. We've had four knock events just here. If I zoom right in, go from here to here, that was when the engine was between 6,800 and 6,900 RPM. So there was, you know, it's very quick. You know, this is not um, the, the time that took um, a 0.26 of a second. Um, it had four knock events. So that was four clicks of debt. Um, in quarter of a second so you know you're never going to be able to react to that if you saw a light flashing on the dash or something that's so quick that you need the automatic knock control to intervene which is exactly what it did and what you'll see down here the knock retard every time it had one of these knock events in a very small window it, it retarded more and more you can see this this value and it was always cylinder three again so those four events all happened on one cylinder um and when you look at knock retard three which is yellow that that had one two three four applications of additional retard um and when you look at the maximum retard it had it was 4.3 degrees now i think i've configured this so that the maximum retard it can do is five degrees but that got pretty close to the maximum kind of remit that I've given the ECU to pull ignition because, you know, let's say the base spark angle was 12 degrees and it pulled five degrees out. That's down to seven and that's really retarded. That's not where you want to be. But in this case, you know, it probably retarded it to, let's have a look, let's add another. Let, let's see what it added in. I can show you what the, the final ignition angle was for that cylinder. So spark angle three, cylinder three. Um, let's just zoom in. You can see it was at 15 degrees, which is a pretty respectable amount of ignition for a turbocharged engine, especially a high compression one like this. And then as it pulled those, those degrees out at, at its peak here, um, you can see this, this here was the peak retardation it dropped it down to 10.9 degrees so that goes kind of below the 12 degrees that i said was you know where you want it but it was very minimal for a short period of time so that in itself is not going to result in you know excessive exhaust temperatures that are prolonged that are going to damage anything it was one click of debt or a few clicks of debt in a small period it rapidly pulled the ignition out to stop the debt and then you know, almost immediately after that, I was off the throttle anyway here. So, you know, I was, I was changing gear um, into fourth gear. Um, and you've got to think of how quickly this is happening. This whole event was a quarter of a second. You know, it looks a lot when you're looking at it on the big screen. When you look at the time scale, that was 16 seconds to 17 seconds in, um, which, thinking about it, was probably going down, coming out of the pits at Brands on the Indy and going around Paddock and nailing it up down towards Druids. So it was probably, let me just think, yeah, so out of the pits, trailing the throttle around Paddock, making sure no one's going to clip me on the way through after coming out of the pits, and then getting around the bend um, and then smashing the throttle all the way down up to Druids. Um, and it was really just that initial crack did it. Um, on the throttle that triggered that, that knock event here. <coughs> um, now, that could be heat soak, could be that where it's been in the pits and I've been waiting to pull onto the track, that you know, things have heated up a bit and that, that's assisted um, knock and then that may not have happened again. 
But let's let's go and have a quick look at the next piece of knock. Um, but well, what's interesting is between here and here, there were there was no knock, right? So when you look at knock sum, it was four all the way through this period. So from that event to here, but when you look down at the knock retard, it retarded the ignition several times um, because it had learned from previous laps or the the first knock event. That we just looked at it learned that retard requirement and it applied that under those conditions even though the engine wasn't knocking and it wasn't knocking because it's applied that retarded ignition um so looking at the next knock event which was here um let's see what conditions the engine was in so this was cylinder two so we look here that says cylinder two knocked this was the fifth knock event, so the previous four were all in one quarter of a second. This is now cylinder two knocks. Um, <coughs> and, you know, the same thing happened. It, it retarded cylinder two. Knock retard was 1.6 um, because of that. But don't forget, cylinder three is three degrees retard because of the previous knock events and behavior. It's learned that. So it had already retarded cylinder three. But this was, you know, this was coming on the throttle, right? So this is, the green line shows me stamping on the throttle um, after a, a corner. Um, the throttle plate itself took, you know, reacted um, based on how I've mapped it. So this knock event actually happened just as the throttle was opening, um, which is the yellow line, ignore the, the pedal, but this was as the throttle opened, it had a bit of knock. Now that you could arguably call that transient debt. But there's there is a, there is something called transient knock, which is where you know when you're cruising. You know when we looked at the spark table before, um, when you're cruising, you run a lot of advance, and then when you stamp on the throttle and the map value changes, um, you can end up with a slight delay in retarding the ignition, and that can cause transient debt. Or transient knock and that's not particularly particularly destructive because uh, the engine's not really under a huge amount of load i mean you look here where that knock event happened here we were only at 1.2 bar 1.15 uh, absolute so it barely had any boost at all i mean what's that 0.1 of a bar one and a half pounds of boost you know it's negligible um but the ignition angle was 20 degrees so the chances are that was just too much. Um, it was one click of debt. Now, that could be a false positive. That could have been a VTEC solenoid clicking. It could be anything else that just happened to make a noise at the, at, in the window that the knock detection thought it was sending to two. So, you know, when you have one click like this, sometimes if it's not repeatable, it may be a false positive. Um, and I have looked into that. I was thinking that, when the throttle plate shuts, might be triggering the knock detection. But this is obviously throttle opening, not won't apply. So I wouldn't worry too much about this one. It was a single event. But let's let's find subsequent events. Um, here's the next one. What were the conditions for this? So this was knock sum five. Now we're on knock sum six. So that was cylinder three again, our favourite cylinder three. Um, and the conditions were. We were at 5,200 RPM, we were at full boost at 0.7 bar um, and detected knock. And again, um, the knock retard for cylinder three bumped up again. It had gradually dropped, um, but it bumped it up again um, as we went through. And it's like it increases that retard value from, <coughs> from that engine speed to here, which was... 5,200 RPM to 6,000. Um, cylinder three got retarded from three to, by three degrees to 4.3. So that's probably previously learned the 4.3, um, and it's continuously applying that. Um, but again, you know, the minimum spark angle cylinder three ran was 11.8. Fine. So, you know, this knock control is working well. It's, it's it's protecting the cylinders. It's not resulting in overly retarded ignition angles it's not going to melt the turbo um it's reacting quickly it's learning it's adapting over time 
it's working really well. But what's important is, you know, this is it's a hot day, it's a hot engine, the water temperature's too hot, the oil temperature's getting to like 120 degrees. It's not it's not a, a cool running engine to say the least. Um and the knock control is having to intervene, right? And it's doing its job and it's doing it well. Um let's just look at the last knock event, um, which was up here. By the way, this log viewing software, Bowder's Data Viewer, is a free download and it will load logs from many, many different types of ECU. Um, this is like one view which shows you basic charts, which are fully configurable, but you can also have different types of um, charts as well. You can have scatter plots or histograms. Um, you can do some really interesting stuff, even plot GPS coordinates um, to show you. Um, data from going around a circuit. So that's all built into this ECU and you don't need to spend thousands and thousands um, on a professional motorsport ECU to get that kind of functionality. Um, so the last knock event here for this three minutes of driving around Brands Hatch, um, let's see what cylinder it was. So knock cylinder was zero before the knock event and then going here, cylinder two. So the knock events throughout this three lap session at Brands Hatch, it shows that it's only cylinders two and three that are knocking. Um, and again, you know, my theory is these are the two cylinders that are in the center of the engine. They get less cooling potentially than cylinders one and four, but it could be an exhaust manifold design or um, an inlet manifold design. I, I suspect that Honda, I'm running a Honda FN2 inlet manifold I suspect that that's probably designed pretty well. When you look at the exhaust manifold that I've got, and I'll, I'll put a picture up, um, it's a crappy log manifold where you've got a center exit for the turbine. And then, so cylinders one and four are having to turn around a really sharp corner to get to the flange for the turbo or the pipe that goes to the turbo, whereas cylinders two and three have a much more direct path out there. So in theory, cylinders one and four may not flow as well, um, and cylinders two and three may flow better, which means they are going to run leaner comparative to cylinders one and four when you're using a common lambda sensor in the downpipe. Um, so it could be the exhaust manifold design that is, is basically causing the debt um, in cylinders two and three rather than one, two, three, and four. That would be a reasonable hypothesis to. To try and prove. So just kind of reflecting a bit, um, you can see that temperature makes all the difference. On a warm day, the fairly light driving, without the temperatures being like 105 degrees on the water, I think they were like 90 something, it's still debt started to creep in. But that's a, that's a function of ambient air temperature, water temperature, oil temperature, charge air temperature that's going into the engine. All of those things, because the ignition hasn't changed between February and July, um, but it shows that those other factors that are changing environmentally are um, reducing the amount of ignition that you can run. That's probably not a surprise to anybody that's used to tuning engines that, you know, ideally when you tune an engine, you should tune it in the summer on the hottest day because that's kind of the worst scenario to tune an engine because of what we've talked through on this video. Um, so tuning it in February um, is great as long as the temperature stays at five degrees. But So we, we've shown that we've talked through on a, on, a, on a hot day, that impacts the amount of ignition you can run. The knock control is likely to intervene, which we've demonstrated. Um, and we've also looked at some track use with heavy load, sustained load, only three minutes, um, and just how much the knock to, uh, to intervene, which you can see here um, along this bottom uh, trace across the three minutes. This is the knock control doing its thing. Uh, ideally, that would be a completely clean trace, um, 
and there are things that I can calibrate in the ECU, which I may do a subsequent video on, which basically gives you um, ignition trims based on coolant temperature, based on individual cylinders, based on all different factors. I can try and learn the model of the engine and how it behaves under different conditions, different temperatures, and adjust the, the map, the calibration, to suit the specific engine and the specification that I so that the knock control will effectively smooth out and it will only intervene if there's something fundamentally wrong in any condition. And, you know, to give you an idea, a manufacturer, Ford or whoever, when they map an engine, they will map it on the dyno. They, they do various different sets of calibrations on the dyno for different reasons. But then they do road testing and road calibration and environmental testing. They will run these engines like production cars in minus 40 degrees and then they will go and do it in hot temperatures they'll drive it all around the world they'll go to the desert they'll go to up mountains they'll go to australia they'll go wherever to basically build the the model and the characteristics of how the engine performs under all these conditions and it takes about, about two years i mean that may be better these days but it used to take about two years for a manufacturer to be able to fully map production cars um, to work anywhere in the world um, and you can see just from this basic testing here that <clears throat> you know just to change from you know a mild winter in the UK to a mild summer and fairly light driving I'm not towing a caravan you know or doing uphill racing or going in the mountains anything ridiculous just a, a little squirt on a faster road and I'm already starting to see how the engine isn't 100% happy with what I'm asking it to do with how. So it's super important to to either map the engine super safe and be you know hit it with a sledgehammer basically and say right I just want this to be super safe under all conditions. Which if you're going to do that, map it in the summer. Pick, pick the hottest day, 30 degrees. Map the engine so it's super safe on that day, and then you know for the rest of the year it's more than likely going to be safe. Um, or if you map it on a cold day then expect what I'm seeing here, which is, you know, safety mechanisms that we've mapped into the ECU are having to come into play to protect it on the hot days. So now that I've got this data, um, I will be making some tweaks to the maps so that it is more naturally happy on warmer days um, in, a, in, a, in a smart way. So per cylinder trims and um, factors like that, so that, you know, the ECU is not having to work so hard to, to keep the engine in one piece. It's perfectly happy doing so. Um, but I personally would prefer to see um, this particular chart here with this knock retard. I'd rather see that reduced the next time. I'm probably not going to change it for now because the thing I'm focusing on next and at the moment is improving the cooling of the engine. So what I would prefer to do is to fix the coolant temperature problem, the oil temperature problem, and then take it back out on track, repeat the test, so three laps of brands. I mean, it's going to be difficult to do it on the same ambient temperature, but go back out on track, repeat the test, but with better cooling before I start changing the calibration of the spark table or the uh, trim, per cylinder trims and things like that. Because the engine's okay, it's in one piece, it's handling it. I'd rather just change one thing at a time, repeat the test and see how it differs. The knock might go away. If I can keep the coolant temperature to high 80s, low 90s, and the oil temperature at a sensible value, um, there may be no knock. It may go away or, or greatly reduced. And then that will give me a much better idea of is it the engine temperature that is fundamentally causing the knock. If I do all those things, reduce the, you know, manage the coolant temperature, keep it flat throughout, you know, a dozen laps um, and all of that, and I'm still seeing the knock, then it then probably is a function of ambient temperature. Turbocharger heats the air up. You know, it's the, it's the temperature of the air that's going into the engine that is probably responsible for the knock on those warmer days. And then that's fairly easy to tune around. So... I really hope that that's been informative. You've, you've sat here and listened to me droning on for a while. Like I said, this is the first of a new series of nerd out sessions. This is specifically about 
not control and spark and you know, it's a bit of an introduction to Bowder's CU and the, the log viewer and it's my interpretation of a few things that have been going on over the last few months so I hope that's been something to you um, please let me know in the comments or send me some feedback um, you know it's a it's a log analysis you've been staring at a screen with lots of colored lines on it me droning on for a while um, but if it's been useful let me know if you'd like to see something different let me know if you'd like a different format let me know all feedback is good um, or if you'd like to see more of this um, let me know as well so i've got a few more videos in mind um, of, a, of a similar thing um, if you'd like it to be much more short and concise let me know and I'll, I'll try and tailor it to the audience but this is the kind of crap that goes around in my head this is what i spend my time looking at yeah so thanks for watching thanks for listening i know it's a, a faceless video but i've got a face for radio as they say and i'll catch you on the next one